W. H. Auden's poem, As I Walked Out One Evening, was first published in 1938 under the title Song. The poem is a conversation between a lover and the clocks that interpret his claims of eternal devotion. The first stanza establishes a setting and a pace for the walk we are about to begin with the speaker. Arden introduces the time of day, evening, and specific location, Bristol Street, London, England. Bristol Street is crowded this time of day, and the people moving together reminds the speaker of fields of harvest wheat. As we walk down the crowded street with the speaker, we begin to feel the pace of his stride echoed in the rhythm of each line. Auden describes the wheat in terms of time or when it is to be harvested. Fall, the harvest season, is often used in art as a metaphor for old age because it is the last stage of life cycle, with the plants past bloom and fruit and cold winter coming. Here the speaker sees the crowd and thinks of the fields in the fall, the golden wheat and our journey to our winter years. After passing through the crowd, the speaker arrives at a brimming river where he hears two lovers talking under an arc of the railway. The poem becomes a dialogue which will extend for the rest of the stanzas. And here the scenery seems to reflect the mood of the lovers. The water in the river rises on its banks. The arc they stand under resembles a huge door to a cathedral or the gates of heaven. The two perhaps believe their love will keep them together forever since love has no ending. The speaker eavesdrops on the lovers, listens to their promises of eternal devotion. Their words seem almost absurd like when they place their love on a geologic time scale. They conclude that their love will survive as long as it would take for China and Africa to slide together in continental drift or for a river to find its course over a mountain. The seven stars in line 15 are probably the constellation Pleiades known in mythology to the seven sisters. The lovers makes perhaps the most grandiose claim. He asserts that the years will pass as fast as rabbits because he holds the flower of the ages in his hand as if their love were so apart from time who could pluck all of history like a flower and offer it to her. Perhaps like many lovers, they are convinced their love is the first love of the world. This image is the last of several which imply that love can conquer time and keep the two together for eternity. But these lines also mark the end of the lover's dialogue, which is cut short by the tolling of the city bells. Just as the lovers reach their most exaggerated climes of devotion, all the clocks in the city began to whirl and chime. The speaker imagines in the tolling bells another voice, perhaps responding to the youthful promises of the lovers. Auden gives the clocks human voices in poetic device called allegory. Using allegory, a poet treats more abstract concepts like time and justice as if they were characters in a play their names capitalized appropriately. In this way, the clocks are able to speak for time, warning the lovers, Oh, let not time deceive you. You cannot conquer time. No matter how much they may love each other, it is not going to save them from their own mortality. The description of time is compared to something that hides in the burrows of the nightmare. Watching the lovers from the shadows and waiting for them to kiss just so it can interrupt with a cough. Whereas the dialogue of the lovers is filled with the statements of eternal hope, the clocks quickly remind the two that time is always there, lurking, clearing its throat like an impatient conductor, 
waiting for the last few passengers to get aboard the dark train. We are not going to live forever, time reminds us, because the day we are born is the first day counting down to our death, because in headaches and in worry, vaguely life leaks away. Time's fancy may be death itself, which could arrive at any moment, even tomorrow or today. This horrible raw truth may be the naked justice mentioned a few lines previous, the mortal rules we must all follow. Echoing the image of harvest wheat returns to the cycle of the seasons, the green valley of youth giving way to winter and its appalling snow that covers the ground. Appalling means terrible, but also literary means to make pale. The snow makes the hills white, white like the color of an old man's hair or the pale faces of the sick and dying. The clocks seem to scold the arrogance of the lovers, telling them that not only is it impossible to conquer time, but rather time itself breaks the threaded dances and the diverse brilliant bow. Following the image of a diverse descent from cliff to water, time's instructions for the lovers to plunge your hands in water, plunge them in up to the wrist, may be a symbolic act of cleansing, similar to the ritual of baptism or the washing of a body before its burial. While their hands are submerged, time commands the lovers to look at themselves in the mirrored surface of the water and wonder what you have missed. The lovers up until now had only been looking forward. Here time reminds them to look back and take inventory of their short lives. The tone of the poem shifts, taking an almost fairy tale or nursery rhyme qualities. The images become more fanciful and absurd, such as a glacier knocking in a cupboard and a desert sighing in a bed. Even the crack starting in the teacup widens until we can see the road we are walking down in life for what it is, a lane to the land of the dead. The tone shift to a more childlike voice, giving these lines an even spookier effect. The soundtrack and the scene not quite right for each other, leaving us feeling uneasy. Time goes on for another stanza in this nursery rhyme voice, invoking images from Jack and the Beanstalk and Jack and Jill. Unlike their moral and innocent counterparts, the characters in these stanzas are a bit more perverse. The giant enchanting to Jack and Jill seduced who goes down on her back. Bringing us back to the water's reflection, Time commands the lovers again to look in the mirror, to look inside themselves and realize who they really are. What does time want them to see? Perhaps their status as fallen creatures expelled from the garden of eternal beauty and life. According to Judeo-Christian mythology, man was expelled from Eden for his sins and willingness to be corrupted. As a result, we are mortals who are given a short time to walk on the earth, no longer in control of time but prisoner to it, as life remains a blessing, although we cannot bless. The mirror of the previous stanza gives way to a window, as if the reflective surface faded and the lovers now stare through clear grass, realizing their mortal fate, their tears scald and start blurring their vision. The corruption seems to resurface. It traces Judeo-Christian mythology which cites our own sin and corruption as a reason for our mortal lives. In other words, Adam and Eve had the chance to live in a garden of eternal love but were seduced by Satan and forced to leave. After eight stanzas of allegorical dialogue where time scolds the lovers for their arrogance, these last four lines return the reader to the dramatic situation of the poem, the two lovers near the river. Just as sudden as they had started, the bells stop their chiming and we realize the whole imagined dialogue may have only spanned the time it took for the clock tower to toll eight, nine or ten times. The dramatic situation of the poem may be as simple as this. 
the speaker walks down to the river and hears the lovers singing. The city clocks chime the hour and interrupt the lovers. But in that brief chiming, the speaker hears the underlying meaning of the moment. No matter what the lovers may promise each other, the clock is ticking and their time on this earth is measured out in hours, days, months and years. Before the speaker realizes how far his mind had drifted, the lovers were gone, perhaps final proof of their impermanence. Even for the speaker, it is late, late in the evening, by the end of the poem. But like the cycle of seasons we pass through, time will continue as we come and go, just as the river brimming nearby will continue to flow, carving its path forever deeper toward the ocean.